In Massachusetts, the cost of running the state's emergency shelter system through the next fiscal year is expected to cost more than $1 billion. So the Healy administration has once again changed rules for the system. Under the new policy that went into effect at the beginning of the month, migrants and homeless families living in state-operated overflow shelters will be limited to just five days. Some families have already been given eviction notices. Also, families who choose to stay at one of those shelters will be required to wait at least six months before they can qualify for placement at a longer-term facility in the shelter system. And for long-term shelter sites, the state will expand its priority list to include families with veterans or families who become unhoused due to a fire or a natural disaster. Now, those rules would be relaxed for some families for up to 30 days, including those who are close to securing housing. Joining us are two state representatives following the migrant situation closely, Democratic State Rep Erica Eiderhoven of Somerville and Republican State Rep Marcus Vaughn, who represents part of the town of Norfolk, where an overflow shelter is already operating. All right, so Governor Healy says all these policy changes are being made because the state is out of shelter space, can no longer afford the current size of this problem. Here she is late last week. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is get people working, um, get people out of shelter. And we also need to free up shelter space for Massachusetts families who may be experiencing homelessness or fleeing from domestic violence or the like. What's happening right now is case managers are on site continuing to work with families to relocate families. And that's going to continue. So when I hear that, it sounds like she's saying, look, no more room at the end. Uh, we, we can't simply afford anymore to, to, to house these families. Your, your understanding of that assessment, do you agree with that assessment from the governor? I mean, I think it's clear that the cost is, is a real problem, but also the issue here is that what are we doing to actually solve the underlying problem? And what's happening, what I see this as, is that we're passing the buck to you know, other support services, and particularly our municipalities. And that's not going to solve the underlying problem. We need to ensure that we're actually helping people get stable housing, get employment, right? Be able to, um, you know, get all of their uh, issues and problems figured out. But to just say with barely two weeks notice now, right, and a five day notice, you're making families decide, like, are my kids and I going to sleep on the street? I mean, that's just a just purely moral and um, concerning and really deeply upsetting situation that we are in. And I just don't think that's who we are as Massachusetts or as the United States. So the site's already operating in, in Norfolk. I know you were concerned even before it started operating in June. What have you seen since then and what do you make of the governor's assessment? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously the entire crisis um, at, at the forefront, uh, you know, this is a federal issue. Um, we were dealt with this hand very early on. About a year and a half ago, we started seeing, you know, more NGOs, you know, facilitate individuals coming to our state. Um, and we were, I think, a bit caught off guard. Um, I'm glad to see that the governor is now taking, you know, further steps as far as mitigating some of the issues that we're having here. But um, as the representative stated here, I mean, we still have an obligation with these families. Um, you know, we can't just have families on the street. Uh, that five-day uh, limit... Uh, will definitely lead to, we've already seen it as far as uh, the previous week, uh, families sleeping in front of Boston Medical Center. Um, you know, there's only so many third-party uh, support services out there in, in the Commonwealth uh, with limited beds. Uh, we're, we're limited as far as, uh, as far as affordable housing at this point. I just don't see uh, where these people transition at this point, even given the fact that we're giving them vouchers, plane bus, or, 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 or train tickets. Uh, to their sponsors that originally, um, you know, vouched for them from the beginning. So um, it's something that you, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, see the effects of it um, over the next week or two um, and how this all shapes up. But, um, you know, we're, we're committed to making sure that, again, Massachusetts residents are well cared for uh, while still caring for those individuals, asylum seekers uh, and individuals coming into our state that need need support services. So let's talk about space and money. As things stand today, do you believe that there is space in the Commonwealth uh, to either open up more shelters or, or to house more families at the shelters that are already open? Well, I think that draws to a really bigger question we have here is that we have an affordable housing crisis in Massachusetts. Um, and I think that's what I mean by the root causes that we actually need to address. Because even before the migrant crisis, we had 3,000 families with children right out on the streets uh, in Massachusetts. We have one of the highest, and Boston is the second highest homeless population um, among the major cities. 
that to me is an issue around affordable housing that we need to actually figure out where are people going to go um, because I don't you know that's a it's a misconception out there that people want to stay in shelters no one wants to stay mm. in a shelter we want to get people long term housing but that draws back to this bigger issue that everyone is very familiar with, which is that living and um, people are spending, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of their income on housing costs. Mm -hmm. There's this dire need. And while I'm very proud of the housing bond bill that we just passed, that the governor just signed into law, uh, we need to do a lot more than that, right, in terms of ensuring that we have the affordable housing available. Um, you know, I think certainly, right, Massachusetts, we have space to welcome people, and that is part of our core values as a state. Uh, we just need to now move forward on actual long-term sustaining solutions rather than what I see this as a very um, haphazard, not well thought out. I mean, there's not really even a policy out there. Like we, um, you know, if you think of the third party or um, with homeless advocates, um, you know, physicians, uh, people who work in mutual aid and individuals, nonprofits who are trying to help these people, we have no information about who these families are, um, where are they going, what is their situation, how can we help them? Um, this has moved so quickly, and I think that's really the issue here, is that we need to be much more intentional and thoughtful about how do we get people permanent, mm -hmm. long-term sustaining solutions. Right. I, and I think a lot of people will understand that, yes, the, the state is in an affordable housing crisis, yeah. but you're not going to fix that in the five business states right. that these people have. Is there other space out there? Obviously, it's, it's your housing folks in Norfolk. When you look around the Commonwealth, do you see other places where you might be able to have these folks go to, understanding that resources can't be everywhere across the Commonwealth? At, at, at the moment, I, I you know, realistically don't see any other scenario where we're able to house these individuals. I mean, even as far as last month, uh, I think we were 800 on the waiting list, 800 individuals on the waiting list. We should never be in a situation where we have that many people in need on the waiting list uh, for uh, suitable housing, and especially emergency housing, um, you know, as no fault to, of their own. Um, so right now in the Commonwealth, no, there is no other space available, and it would take a her Herculean effort at this point to basically drum up, you know, the amount of space needed and, and suitable housing to house these people. Do you think that is something the state could do, though, if, if, it, if it really wanted to, to, to find, yes, a, a somewhat short-term solution? I mean, I think we have to get creative and figure out a solution here because the alternative is much, much worse, right? We're going to have children and families sleeping on the streets. Um, you know, I'm proud of the fact that Massachusetts is a right to shelter law. It's something that we put in place 40 plus years ago in the 80s. Um, and that's actually how we've now structured our shelter system is that because of this law in the 80s, um, the family shelter system is managed by the state. There is no family shelter system managed by municipalities mm. or at the local level. So the question is, if they're getting kicked out, where do they go? They really virtually have nowhere else to go because the other shelter systems are for individuals. They're not for families. And it's because of this, you know, this context that we live in. Um, so I think that that's where we do need to figure out more solutions. Now, we don't have the immediate, this is where they have to go. But to say that, oh, we're just going to put them out on the street, it's not the right choice either. And that puts people in a really challenging position. I, I would argue, too, that, you know, we know from um, studies and, and, you know, what other countries have done and what other cities and states have done that when you house people, you actually save money as a state, right? That is actually the fiscally responsible thing to do, that every dollar invested in shelter or housing returns double that in terms of economic return, in terms of, you know, people being able to get back on their feet and be able to be contributing members of our society. And so that's the kind of, of course, the long-term vision that we need to work towards. But putting people in, and particularly people who have just faced eviction, right, now in this lurch of uncertainty is not only harmful for those individuals and for those families, but it's actually harmful to our local economy and it's harmful to our society. On the money side of things, $9 billion in the state's rainy day fund. Should we tap into that? No. Um, as fiscally conservative um, as I am, uh, you know, we, we don't need to continue to, to tap into, you know, additional coffers uh, for this crisis. I mean, obviously, uh, it's, it's unsustainable up until this point. Um, it's going to continue to be unsustainable if we don't uh, take a, you know, grapple with it at this moment um, and take onus of what we've created. Um, you know, over a billion dollars that's already been allocated. Mm -hmm. They're saying, you know, potentially over two billion dollars over the next couple of years. Um, it's unsustainable, especially with uh, the amount of revenues that are that are down right now in the Commonwealth. Um, it's 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 really unsustainable at this point. What do you think? Should they tap into it? 
I mean, I don't think we should be tapping into the rainy day fund. What I do think we need is sustaining forms of revenue. Um, and I think that the fact that in actually Massachusetts, we've cut taxes over the past 40 years. We have opportunities to raise progressive taxation where the wealthy and people most able to pay should be paying their fair share. And they're currently not because we have an upside down tax code for most of the income brackets. Um, so there are opportunities for us to raise revenue. I'm disappointed that the governor, you know, initially very at the very first term part of her term that she proposed a billion dollars in tax cuts. I don't think that was forward thinking in terms of what we could be doing with that funding, particularly because we know that that is actually the fiscally responsible thing to do is to house people, to invest in social services, education, transportation. Um, so I do think there's a lot of opportunities there to raise revenue. And I will also add that, you know, there's also places in the budget to find this funding. We have some of the most expensive prisons and jails in the country, $130,000 per person incarcerated. That to me is not a good use of funding and should be changed. So there are options that I think the governor and the legislature can be working with, but we do need to think more creatively and more forward thinking about how this funding can be best used. Before I let you go, um, I want to talk about the end of this past session. Yeah. Uh, some late nights uh, yes. for, for the both of you. Why does it always really kind of seem to come to this where you have marathon sessions, yeah. lawmakers voting on bills that they didn't even have time to read or debate? Obviously, Marcus, sitting on your side of the aisle, you're I'm basically sitting back and then <laughs> saying, Democrats, get your stuff together. But yes. why does it always kind of seem to, to come to this? And, and while, while you all did pass some major legislation, do Massachusetts residents sort of end up bearing the brunt of it because of some of the things that you guys aren't able to get done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that what was so disappointing at the end of this session is that we actually had consensus on a lot of issues in the sense that we have voted as a legislative body on so many bills, both in the House and the Senate, and yet they didn't get past the finish line in the last hour. And that points to your issue that you just raised around why do we push everything to the last minute? Um, I think there's issues around, I mean, particularly that those decisions are made by such a small number of people who are negotiating behind closed doors. And um, when they can't come to an agreement or come to, an, you know, to, to a successful negotiation, you know, one tactic is certainly to stall, stall, stall. Um, I don't think it's in the benefit of the Massachusetts residents and our voters to be doing that. And that's why I am calling for us to return to a special session. Um, I'm running and we're both running for re-election. I'm happy to come back and get the job done because it is in service of our work as, as serving the public and serving Massachusetts residents to get these policies passed. I know it's cliche, but is this dims in disarray in, 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 on Beacon Hill? So I, I think it's a matter of, I mean, obviously I can't speak for, you know, Senate president and Speaker of the House, um, you know, with those disagreements that go on be, behind closed doors. But, you know, I think we need to, you know, open up, uh, you know, what those discussions are, uh, be more transparent. Definitely not le letting it go until the 11th hour. Um, you know, there were plenty of opportunities earlier in the year when we could have been in formal session to get, you know, some of these large pieces of legislation passed through, um, you know, that benefit uh, our constituents here in the Commonwealth. And I just hope, uh, you know, that they do call us back in uh, to get down, get done the people's work as they elected us to do. Do you want to go, go back in for a special oh, session? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Both of you, thank you so much for being here on that issue. We really do appreciate you taking the time. Rep. Erica Iverhoven and Marcus Vaughn, we appreciate thank it. Thank you, thank you guys. You